Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! A month ago, by his own admission, you probably hadn't heard much about Owen Smith. Indeed, he was barely a household name in his own household. Tonight, though, he lays out the credentials and the policies he believes will see him successfully challenge Jeremy Corbyn for the leadership of the Labour Party. Before that, though, Newsnight's political editor Nick Watt joins me to discuss the scale of that challenge and the wider travails of the Labour Party. And that challenge, Nick, just got a little bit bigger. I've checked the dictionary. There is no verb to unresign, but it's in the news nonetheless. It is indeed. And we think of you as an erudite person, James, so <laughs> I defer to you on that matter. Yes, the curious spectacle of Sarah Champion resigning and then unresigning sent an email to Jeremy Corbyn saying that she'd like her job in the Shadow Home Office team back. Thank you very much. And then an intriguing, rather pointed response from Jeremy Corbyn. A, a source uh, in his office told the BBC that this was like the miners' strike when the first miners went back to work and we'll see where it goes from there. Now, as I understand it, what that is signalling is when Parliament comes back in September, you may well see a few more of not these ex-shadow cabinet, but these middle uh, and lower ranking former shadow ministers saying they want to come back. Uh, the coup was a failure, they were sold a pup, and it's time to knuckle down, otherwise the SNP will just end up as the main opposition at Westminster. What, what does the uh, broader picture mean for both contenders, then? What well, does it mean for Mr Smith, who we'll meet in a moment, and good news for Mr Corbyn? Well, I think for Jeremy Corbyn, he's had a difficult few days, and it's got, at one level, to be good news for him, because somebody who thought he was no good now says it's right to be back in his team. But eyebrows are being raised at that comparison with the minor striker. Mm. Uh, that's a bit of a provocative thing to say, is what some people are saying. For Owen Smith, at one level, it's not very good. He is the beneficiary of that coup, and that person, Sarah Champion, is now saying, perhaps I should be back on board working for the person that Owen Smith wants to replace. But at another level, I think Owen Smith will be able to distance himself from this. This decision was made ten days ago. It was held back to allow Sarah Champion to lead a backbench Westminster debate on online child abuse. And crucially, Sarah Champion was, a no was among a number of shadow ministers whose offices were carrying on supporting their shadow teams, the sort of work that we don't see behind the scenes. Nick, thank you. I know we'll see more of you later. So we will also hear from Owen in just a moment. But before that, here's a little reminder about his journey to the leadership contest. Uh, I won't be entering a contest against Jeremy Corbyn uh, or anybody else. So proud to be addressing you, launching my bid to be the next leader of the Labour Party and more importantly than that, the next Labour Prime Minister of this country. I would serve you with great uh, humility and respect. You'd be a good leader of this party. I think I could also be a good leader of this party. I'm withdrawing uh, from this race and supporting Owen. He dialed 999 to get a quote from the police. Instead of the police then, themselves then actually, or the press office. And they then actually complained about you. I mean, what does this say about your judgment? You, we all, we all do daft things when you're young. Well, the country has to look at us and say, we can imagine these people running this country and doing so better than the Conservatives. That's the task I'm setting myself. That's the task I'm setting everybody in Labour, and I expect us to achieve it. And Owen Smith joins me now. Let's begin with, uh, with today's little local difficulty. This was your ace in the hole, Owen Smith, the, the desertion of ministers from Jeremy Corbyn and the vote of no confidence from the Parliamentary Labour Party. And yet Sarah Champion's actions today suggest, well, there's a crack in the facade. Well, look, Sarah's a friend and she's a, she's a great MP, but to be honest, James, we've gone beyond MPs now, haven't we? It's... it's... The MPs are rather irrelevant, other than Jeremy and myself in standing to contest the leadership. It's the members who count that. Sarah's vote is just one vote amongst 500,000 members of the Labour Party. She'll get to cast that vote. She has to decide whether she's going to vote for me or Jeremy, or whether she serves in the couple of weeks when Parliament comes back is, I think, neither here nor there. Well, that's not quite right, is it? It must have been a huge part of your decision to stand that the Parliamentary Labour Party was pretty much uh, voting over 70% no confidence in the leader and these ministers, both Cabinet level and junior, were deserting in their droves. This is 
even if unresigned isn't a word, this is the opposite of desertion. So one of the fundamental foundations of your leadership bid is shaking. Well, no, I don't think it is, to be honest, James. I, mean, I think the truth is that the reason I stood was in order to try and unite the Labour Party. We had, obviously, a massive crisis of confidence in the parliamentary Labour Party in Jeremy. The job of the leader of the Labour Party is to lead united opposition at Westminster or to lead a government at Westminster. He couldn't do that. Most of those MPs now have nominated me overwhelmingly to challenge Jeremy. And Sarah deciding to go back in is, I think, actually a pretty minor part of this why, why story. Why do you think she's done it? Um, look, I think a lot of people will feel that, um, you know, they want, to, they want to fight the Tories. You know, a lot of people will legitimately feel, as I do, that we've been giving them too easy a ride recently. And perhaps she feels that she can do that better on the front bench. But in reality, You're, you're of course, on holiday for the next, well, next few weeks. Well, why, the, I mean, what... the point I was going to make. Go on. In reality, there are only two weeks in September and the ballots will have long since gone out by then, so we're right in the sort of last knockings of the leadership contest. In reality, Sarah going back in isn't really much of a story either way. I think I go well, back When does to it become a story, if, if other people well, follow? It, well, I think, it, look, if, if, if 150 members of the Labour Party decide they all would rediscover well, confidence... I'm thinking more of three or four. If three or four of similar well, I, level junior I, ministers, unresi I, unresignations... Well, I suspect that too won't make any difference whatsoever. I think we are still in this position where there is a crisis uh, and the Labour Party is disunited. One or two MPs decided to go back. doesn't really change those basic facts. And I think it's now for me and Jeremy to lay out our stall to explain what it is we think we should be doing in opposition, what we might do in oh, government. I'm glad you said that. And, uh, that, that is, after all, what we're here for. And before we, start, with it. before we start laying out that stall, I wonder whether Sarah Champion has responded perhaps to the siren call of John McDonnell on television on Sunday. Did you see that strange interlude where he that spoke directly the to the camera? You, 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 you saw that. What did you think he was doing? Uh, look, I think John was trying to say, as I've been saying, that we need to... Hang uh, on a minute. Heal, just, heal let, the Party. Let, let's just remind people who perhaps missed it of exactly what did happen on the Andrew Marr show on Sunday. Let me just say this to Labour Party supporters, Labour members, members of the Parliamentary Labour Party. We've got to stop this now. People, there's a small group out there that are willing to destroy our party just to remove Jeremy Corbyn. We've got to stop them. So, I, we're on camera six, Owen. I don't know if you want to direct your response to that straight down the barrel of the camera lens as well, but, but tell us, either to the camera or to me, what you think Mr McDonnell was doing then. Uh, well, I'll tell you, seeing as I think it would look slightly peculiar, as it did with John, to speak down the lens. Look. <laughs> John can say that if he wants. Large part of the reason I'm standing is a meeting with John McDonnell. I went in on that Monday after lots of colleagues had resigned. I went in with five colleagues in order to say, we're not intending to resign, but we want to hear, Jeremy, what you're going to do to save the Labour Party. How are you going to compromise in order to bring us together? John McDonnell pushed his way into that meeting not having been invited. I put it to John directly that I feared that he was part of the small group of people on the far left of the Labour Party who were prepared to see the party split in order to uh, protect his project. And his answer to that was to shrug his shoulders and say, if that's what it takes. That is why I left and that is why I resigned from uh, the front bench. And ultimately, that is why I'm standing, because I do think there is a very real danger that the party will split if Jeremy doesn't move over that the party will be destroyed and the Tories and other forces on the right of British politics will fill the gap that Labour leaves and that will be a disaster because we have been the greatest force for social good for 116 years in this country and it would be a tragedy if we were wiped out and parties can be wiped out it takes a long time for parties to rise but they can be snuffed out just like that and that is what I fear could happen to Labour. Let's look then at your stall, your uh, manifesto, if you will, and particularly looking for clear blue water between you and Jeremy Corbyn. If we started with defence, would you, as a Prime Minister, be spending more or less 
than the current uh, GDP percentage on the defence budget. We should be spending 2%. We should be renewing Trident. Security of the British people has always got to be the, the first order of business for any government, Labour or Tory. So we've got to be serious about that. And one of the weaknesses that we've had recently is that people worry that Labour isn't serious about security, that it's a, a lesser issue for Jeremy, as it were. And I'm not sure that's right, but he's certainly got a different perspective on some of those things, on patriotism, if you like, and on security and on defence. I think I've got a more traditional Labour perspective on that an old-fashioned Labour perspective, if you like, but that's a big difference between us. Well, what do you mean by a different position on patriotism? Well, I think Jeremy, to be honest, doesn't really understand sometimes the way in which people have a very strong, perhaps socially conservative, conservative with a small c, sense of place, sense of where they're from. I'm not sure I've heard him talking much about Scotland and identity or about Wales and identity or indeed about England and identity. I suspect that Jeremy's got a rather more metropolitan sense of that and that's not one I think is central to the Labour tradition. Are you calling him unpatriotic? I'm saying that I think it's not something that is core to his set of beliefs. I think he's got a set of um, liberal perspectives and left perspectives on things and nationhood and nationalism and patriotism aren't really part of his makeup. Stay, staying with Trident, you mentioned old Labour values. I, I think it was Tony Benn who said in reference to our nuclear deterrent that we had the best protected homeless people in the world. And it is this membership, as you've mentioned yourself, the membership of the party who support Jeremy Corbyn, they're very sceptical about Trident. Well, what, 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 aren't you supposed to be winning them over? Yeah, but I've also got to be honest, haven't I, James, about what I feel. And I'm someone who used to believe that getting rid of all of our nuclear weapons unilaterally was the right thing to do. I now feel that the world has become an even more unpredictable, volatile place. You said a moment ago, before we went on air, that it's the first time you've been presenting for a while now without some awful news uh, being broadcast. It does feel to lots of us that every day there is some new extraordinary piece of news around the world. That doesn't feel like, to me, a moment when we should be divesting when did you change ourselves. Your mind? When... I think probably in my mid-twenties. When I was a teenager, I was a member of CND and believed in unilateralism. When I was in my mid-twenties, I think I started to see that there was, a, there was a real case for hanging on to our weapons and Labour's traditional position of multilateral disarmament, using ours as a bargaining chip to get other countries to get rid of theirs too. Uh, Theresa May was asked the other day, of course, whether she would be prepared to press the nuclear button, even in the knowledge that it would mean the, the, the deaths of women and children, civilians. Uh, would you be prepared to press that button? Well, I've been asked that question a couple of times, and I've said yes, because I think if you've got a nuclear deterrent, you have to be prepared to use it. It's a, you know, it's a terrible, terrible necessity. And obviously one would hope that you'd never get anywhere near that. And truthfully, I don't think we ever would get anywhere near it. But the point is, you have to be prepared to do it in order for it to be effective. Let's move on to health, shall we? This is obviously an area in which you've worked and there's been some controversy recently. But in, in, in the context of health, is there room for more, uh, you've called it choice in the past, or, or private sector involvement in the NHS as it currently stands? Truthfully, no. Um, my view you is... Change your mind about this as well, well then? Uh, no, there was a one press release that was written by the company I worked for back in 2000 and five about a report that was commissioned not by me but my predecessor and that's been spun into some suggestion that I'm in favour of privatisation in the NHS. The truth is I'm incredibly proud of the NHS, Labour's greatest creation, I think 100% publicly owned, free at the point of use, NHS should be our position and more than that I think we did open the door to the Tories um, taking our language, that language of choice that was the Labour Party's language in the uh, mid-2000s and using it and subverting it and using it as a Trojan horse for what they want to do, which is to marketise the NHS piece by piece. I fought the NHS bill that has uh, privatised parts of the NHS line by line on the front bench as the junior health spokesperson for Labour. I fundamentally believe that we should be getting back to a period where we've got a very clear sense of what are public goods, public services, and we should be very clear that public service ethos is undermined by allowing it to be diluted. So I think we made mistakes in not realising that you... So you'd row back on this? This, is, this, is, this is private sector provision within the NHS as I it would. stands that you I would think, seek I to think, I think reduce? We need to, I think we need to be really clear that Labour should understand 
what collective ownership of public goods, what the value of that is. It's one of the very few things, if you like, the NHS, that exemplifies socialism in practice. It's the greatest institution in Britain that illustrates what we're all about in Labour, pooling our risks, sharing our rewards, having a service that is universal and used by everyone, paid out of everybody's taxes. It's the essence of Labourism. Like. What, what, Labourism? Yeah. What, what would we be looking at? What, what sort of areas would you be thinking could be pruned, reduced, removed? Um, look, I just think very bluntly that we should be always thinking about public services being held in public hands. For example, the commissioning uh, practice that is now lots of it being done by private sector providers. I think that's a real mistake. It allows profit and costs to become the principal driver of services, not clinical decisions or need. And introducing the profit motive into the NHS, as into other areas of public service, I think both dilutes a sense of public connection to it and undermines, as I said, the essence of what Labour is all about. But beyond the sort of overview, the principled overview, what, what would the detail look just like? Said, commission, well, commissioning. Well, so that's one area, but you'd put a limit on how much private sector involvement there could be? You'd put a, a figure on it, a number? Or? Well, we've done that before, haven't we? We had a cap yes. on the last Labour government. And again, I think that's a mistake. I think we should simply be saying we I'm should asking. want... Well, I think we should be going further than that. We should be saying we want public services to be provided in the public sector by public servants. That should be the overriding objective of Labour because not to do that, as I say, is to risk those things being subverted or the underpinning ethos of them, the ideological purpose of them from a Labour perspective, being eroded. So you would grow the state then in this context, in this section of it? I think, I think we do need to get much bolder about what the role of the state is. I'm going to be doing a couple of big speeches over the next couple of weeks spelling out what I think we got wrong as New Labour. And okay, one of those give, give, things, give me a preview. Well, I've, I've just given you one, which is about the NHS. <laughs> I'm going to talk, well, I'm going to talk about taxation. Right. I'm going to talk about the uh, way in which we expand public services and allow public services to be properly resourced. I'm going to talk about funding across the whole of the UK. I'm going to talk about rights at work and the way in which we protect individuals at work through uh, collective rights and collective means of arguing for better pay and conditions. I've already outlined that we should be reintroducing uh, sectoral wage councils in Britain as an extra bulwark for low-paid workers, in particular women in the retail okay. and hospitality we'll, we'll, sectors. I, we'll we'll, we'll all, look forward to all this. All big things. We must move on to the I word. It underpins so much of British political debate at the moment, immigration. Are there too many immigrants in Britain at the moment? I think it depends where you are, is the truth. So, so yes, in some places. Well, I think in some places, the way in which we saw rapid influx of, in particular, Eastern European migrants after the uh, accession of those countries to Europe, definitely cause downward pressure on wages, definitely cause changes to local terms and conditions for some workers in some sectors. We've got to acknowledge that. There are ways in which we can mitigate those effects, so extra resources, public service resources, extra money for doctors, for school places. My wife's a school teacher, and we've had... Um, you know, significant numbers into South Wales of people fleeing the Middle East. Now, that's something that we, as a government at the centre, should be acknowledging in extra funding to those areas. I know today you've, you've criticised Theresa May's dis decision to do away with a, a, a Minister for Refugees. It's an extraordinary decision. What a, thing, what a thing to do. Would, it, you, would you not be dealing in the business of numbers then with regard to refugees in particular and immigration in general? Well, I think with refugees, absolutely not. We should be... Uh, honouring the great British tradition of being a place of refuge and sanctuary for people fleeing persecution uh, across the world. We've all seen these you know, terrible pictures over the last few summers. We are in the foothills, I think, James, of a global shift of populations, and we are in the foothills of the debate about that, about how we respond to it, our country and other European countries. And I think this debate is going to change a lot over the next few years. So, so to be clear, it was in the manifesto, you, you won your seat on, it was in the, the uh, 2010 manifesto to have a migrant impact fund, wasn't it? Ed Miliband yeah. had that in place already. Still a so, good idea. So, absolutely. So the migrant impact fund notwithstanding, if, if there were a, an upsurge or an increase in the total number of people coming to Britain to work, you'd be comfortable with that if these resources were in place. Well, again, we should be honest about it, shouldn't we? Because part of the way in which some of our economy, some of the service sector, some of the retail sector, etc., part of the way in which that has 
um, bounced back a bit after the recession, although it's looking parlous again now, has been because we've had an influx of effectively cheap labour. Now, should we want that? It's got some economic advantages, there's no doubt about that. What's it doing to squeeze people out of those jobs who are you know, in, living in this country already? All of these things, we've just got to be much more honest and upfront with the British public about the scale of the challenges we face. So if the overall number goes up, you would be comfortable with that if all of these other conditions well, were in place? I think, the Tories, I think the Tories have illustrated perfectly what a boneheaded way it is to go about making policies, to set targets okay. that you know you can't meet. You... Cameron failed completely on this, but Theresa May is frankly making a gross mistake in getting rid of a specific minister on refugees. I think it's a, a really bad thing. Equally, reintroducing detention for child refugees as they effectively did last week, what an appalling thing that is to do. OK, the, 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 you referred obliquely to the referendum result. I, th I think most people accept now that there's a relatively binary choice in place with, with regard to freedom of movement and access to the single market. If we continue to doing business as usual with the European Union, it would probably involve freedom of movement staying in place. If we want to have restrictions on freedom of movement, we'll probably have to do less trade. Which would you pick? I think we've got to be much tougher and much more vigorous in rejecting the notion that it's a binary choice because the message we were sent at that referendum by the British people was I think fairly simple it was one that people wanted still to retain the benefits of trading within Europe and two they wanted some greater constraints over laws being passed from Europe and on immigration yes. now we can choose to do what the Tories are doing which is say well there we go that's that we're out of Europe what are you hard do? Brexit I'd be fighting much, much harder to talk to all of the European parties in power and out of power about how the debate is evolving there. Because in Germany and in France and in Spain, they're having precisely the same discussions. They too... So you're, you're, you're rejecting the tension between well, freedom of I'm, movement I'm and access to the no, free market? No, I'm rejecting the fact that it is, a, it is a binary choice. That is a false choice. And we shouldn't be... We shouldn't be lying down and simply saying these are the terms of the debate we accept it full stop and that means we've got to leave europe it's the worst thing we could possibly do so i'm clear we should get in negotiate much harder our leader should be demanding a seat at those tables we represent nine to ten billion uh, million people who vote labor in this country labor's got a mandate to debate these things most labor voters voted to stay in they did you mentioned mandate mr corbyn's mandate is huge by any measure uh, the the new he keeps telling me that well he, he keeps telling enormous. everybody that because it's true how are you going to beat him well 50 percent just of the members voted for him so let's not forget that i know he goes on about how you know overwhelmingly he won but of the members only just over 50% voted for them. And there's 378,192 of them right now. And I'm going to beat him by going out and talking to as many of those members as I can about what I believe in, which is essentially that Britain has become an incredibly unequal place where people don't feel that they get a fair crack of the whip, where people do feel angry and frustrated that we've had a sense of loss and decline in this country for individuals and communities for a long time, but it's not enough to just moan about it. You've got to put on the table what you're going to do about it to change. And if, if you do win, is there a job for him? In for Corbyn, yeah, cabinet? absolutely. What, what I think you give him? He doesn't want to be president. He told us last week. Well, although he should consider that, shouldn't he? And he I, said to, I said to him, president or chairman? We used to have a chairman. Harold Lasky was chairman of the Labour Party. Would you there give are him a many proper ways. Job? Can you which, see him? Is it, does he yeah, have the competence to have any brief at cabinet level? Yeah, I think level? Jeremy could absolutely do a job in a shadow cabinet for me. I would welcome him. I want to heal the Labour Party. I think Jeremy Corbyn is to be thanked for having helped Labour stop being so timid, rediscover a bit of its radicalism. But we need to go beyond just sloganising about it. We've got to have hard solutions. We've got to be practical. We are practical socialists in the Labour Party, not debaters. Owen Smith, many thanks, thanks indeed.